afternoon and welcome to our Senate lecture. Welcome to our audience here in the Parliament House Theatre and welcome also to our audience online. My name is Rachel Callanan. I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure here with the Department of the Senate. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and thank them for their custodianship of the land and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Today's lecture is being live streamed on the Australian Parliament House website and through the broadcast system here at Parliament House. It's also being Auslan interpreted and captioned. If time permits, uh, at the end of a lecture, we'll do a short Q&A session where you can ask questions of our presenters. I'm very pleased to introduce today's lecturers to you, Dr. Harry Hobbs and Professor George Williams AO. Dr. Hobbs is an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Technology, Sydney. He is an experienced constitutional and human rights lawyer and his work explores questions of sovereignty, statehood and democracy. Dr Hobbs has published numerous works on topics including the legal rights of Indigenous people in Australia, micronations and sovereignty and successionism in Australia. Professor Williams is a Professor of Constitutional Law and Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the UN, uh, University of New South Wales. He has served as Dean of UNSW Law and in 2011, he was made an officer of the Order of Australia for distinguished service to the law in the fields of anti-terrorism, human rights and constitutional law as an academic, author, advisor and public commentator. In addition to his extensive record of scholarly publications, Professor Williams has appeared as a barrister in the High Court of Australia in many cases over the past two decades concerning matters such as freedom of speech, freedom from racial discrimination, and the rule of law. No strangers to collaboration, Dr. Hobbs and Professor Williams will today discuss how parliaments performed during the pandemic. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Hobbs and Professor Williams. And uh, Professor Williams is going to start proceedings. Thank you. My job is to kick things off before passing on to Harry to talk us through some of the details as to how we measure whether Parliament did a good job uh, during the pandemic. What we know is that when the nation is beset by crisis, when there's fear, it's at those times that we often turn to our political leaders and our elected representatives uh, with a sense of hope, with a sense of looking for assurance, uh, with also a sense of looking for decisive action. And we can think of many instances around the world when that's been the case. And in fact, some of our most famous political leaders have been forged in these crises. Think of Winston Churchill during the Blitz. Think of our own John Curtin during World War II, or even a lesser but still a very significant event, uh, John Howard in the aftermath of the Port Arthur massacre. It's also true during these times that Parliament plays a special role. And what we do in this lecture today is ask what role Parliament should have played during the pandemic. Did it live up to those aspirations? And what lessons are there to learn, not if, but when there is a future pandemic facing Australia? The recent pandemic was quintessentially a time when we did look to our leaders and parliaments. And a quick reminder, and it's a bit disturbing in some ways to revisit some of this material, given what we've so recently lived through. But of course, in December 19, COVID was discovered in Wuhan, China. It spread across the globe. A month or so later, the World Health Organization declared a global emergency. Two months later, there were 118,000 cases across 114 countries, and that led to the declaration of a global pandemic. It all happened very quickly and in a very startling way. The first case in Australia of COVID-19 was identified on 25 January 2020. What happened afterwards was that our political leaders acted and brought into place measures that before those things happened over the course of a few weeks and months were unimaginable. Things occurred that simply were beyond the realm of what we thought were possible in this country that our, physical, our political leaders might visit upon us. It included, and of course for me it's a bit like a fevered dream to actually think again as to actually what happened during those days, even though they're so recent. But of course, we closed our borders. Uh, dancing and singing were prohibited. 
uh, we were prevented from visiting loved ones in aged care homes. Many people across Australia were restricted to their homes. And they were just a few of the many, many measures that were brought into place during this period. What was really striking about these measures is almost all of them were brought about not directly by Parliament but by the executive. They were visited upon us by politicians with the advice particularly of their medical officials, their chief health officers, and what they did is they made an extraordinary number of rules over that period of time. Uh, these rules were often announced late at night and sometimes had been changed by the next morning. Such was the rapid pace of lawmaking by the executive. The volume was also extraordinary. Uh, just four months after the first case had been discovered in Australia, at the state and territory level, we'd had nearly 550 new laws made to respond to COVID-19. And at the Commonwealth level, we had 172. Uh, an extraordinarily rapid pace of lawmaking by the executive that had the most draconian impact upon our liberties and for many people spelt the end of their economic livelihoods when we think of the impact upon businesses and the like. So these were measures that were extreme to protect public health and had an extreme impact upon basic liberties. At the same time, it was fair to say that many, if not most Australians supported these measures as a necessary public health measure. They did though ask hard questions about many of them did we really need to close state borders for as long as we did, and particularly in Western Australia, in such a draconian way? Was it really necessary to have nighttime curfews? Did they really amount to a needed public health purpose? Some Australians were so sufficiently agitated that particularly towards the end of these measures they took to the streets. In Melbourne, for example, we saw violent protests against these measures. And around the world, this was replicated in the United States and other countries, as people reacted strongly, violently, to what they saw as a government overreach upon their liberties. These measures, the combination of extreme measures, combined with growing community concern, combined with the extraordinary impact upon people's economic liberties and their personal liberties, posed a grave challenge to government around the world. And it raised big questions about what was the role not just of our leaders but of our parliament. What should parliament have done during the pandemic and what should it have done to maintain public trust and to ensure that the measures we got were proportionate and were always well directed to protecting community safety. What we're hoping to do in this lecture is analyse that question and take a step back from what is often looked at in these areas which is the role of the executive. What did Scott Morrison as our Prime Minister do? What did our premiers do? What, on the other hand, did parliament do? What should its role have been during this time? In asking what the role of parliament should do, we've obviously got to get back to the basics to ask how do we measure or how do we work out whether parliament did a good job during this time? And the starting point for many people is to say, well, surely the role of parliament is to make law. And in fact, if you ask people in the community or give talks in schools, that's what they'll typically say. The job of parliament, its primary function, is to make and change laws. But in fact, a large part of what parliament does isn't about lawmaking at all. In fact, some people have said that lawmaking has never been the dominant function of parliament. That if you look particularly over recent years, law increasingly is not even made by parliament, it's made on behalf of parliament by the executive. And that's certainly borne out by the pandemic, where these measures were visited upon us, not by virtue of a deliberative process within Parliament, but by executive through delegated legislation uh, itself making these decisions, very often without scope for parliamentary involvement or override. If we ask what this Parliament sees as its function, so we can ask whether it lived up to its mandate, the Australian Parliamentary Education Office sets out four main functions that it thinks this parliament should fulfil that I think obviously apply during a pandemic. The first of those functions is to make laws for Australia. The second is to represent the people of Australia. The third is to examine the work of government. And the fourth is to provide a place where government is formed. And these key functions of parliament, the legislature, the legislative, the representative, the accountability and the elective functions are all basic functions that just have, a, have as much pertinence during a pandemic as they have at other times. 
In fact, some of these are even more important during a time of a pandemic. And as to just how important they are, it depends very much on the type of crisis we're facing. So if, for example, the nation is faced by a terrorist attack or during World War II, the prospect of invasion, the role of parliament is very different than during a public health emergency. In the former, where Australia's national security is threatened, you'd expect a fast-moving response and high degrees of secrecy, if only because you can't reveal your plans to the enemy by debating them within parliament. On the other hand, when you're faced with a crisis involving a pandemic or a public health emergency, the opposite is often needed. It's about maintaining public confidence and critically, it's about maintaining participatory governance because the success in combating the pandemic more than anything else can depend upon community goodwill and the willingness of citizens to actually obey public health measures. And to achieve that, Parliament has a vital role in communicating those measures, making people feel as if they are proportionate and that it's reasonable for people to follow those measures. So when we ask, based upon that, based upon a pandemic, based upon the need for high levels of public information, high levels of transparency, high levels of community confidence, Harry and I went back and asked, well, how do we actually measure the performance of Parliament? What are the indicators that we would use? And we came back to four activities that we think summarise these are the things we would expect of the Commonwealth Parliament and of the state and territory legislatures during the pandemic. The first of these things that we look for in this lecture is that during a pandemic, you would expect Parliament to meet regularly. And it needs to meet regularly because its regularity of meeting, the visibility of its meetings is critical for underpinning the legitimacy and source of authority in government. And in fact, particularly during the end of the pandemic, the fact that there are often sittings that were missing at the state and territory level was something that played strongly into community concern, a sense that politicians are exercising extraordinary unchecked powers that their elected representatives had no say over. So we need parliament to meet regularly and it needs to ensure through that regularity that government has policies and administration that are supported by the people via their elected representatives. And it's not just a matter of actually meeting regularly to fulfil those functions, but as I've indicated, being seen to meet regularly, to provide the public confidence that goes with that. The second measure that we looked for is that Parliament should be provided with sufficient time to debate the key measures and issues. And there's always a risk during a crisis that Parliament meets, but it's tokenistic. It's a rubber stamp. It doesn't do anything meaningful during these times and is given such a truncated opportunity to debate and consider that it's not more than a show. And again, it's important that this is a meaningful and sufficient period of time because there needs to be enough time to debate, question, reflect community concerns, and particularly for those people who have concerns, to show that those concerns are dealt with, listened to and responded to by government. And there were many occasions, again, where people indicated they felt that their views were not represented in Parliament. That opportunity was not given, and it was something that fed into the community angst that we saw particularly during the end of the pandemic. The third thing that we will look for, that Harry will measure for, is that Parliament needs to maintain legislative oversight, including of delegated legislation. National crises like a pandemic or a world war do expose us to the need for what otherwise would be regarded as draconian powers. Powers that don't have the same levels of scrutiny or powers that enable extraordinary decisions to be made that affect liberties that we simply would not countenance at any other time. And given those powers, it's particularly important that Parliament is able to maintain legislative oversight. If we take, for example, the leader of the New Zealand House of Representatives, he said, scrutiny during this unprecedented time when the government is placed in the position of exercising such extraordinary powers has never been more important. And in many ways, the more extreme the power, the greater the need for oversight. Yet it's often the very opposite that tends to happen during a crisis. A sense that oversight becomes optional. Oversight is something that gets in the way of governments doing what they need. Yet we would say that oversight is never more vital than during a world war, a pandemic or a similar crisis.
It's for that reason that the absence of oversight often gives rise to the biggest problems and the greatest community concern. The last thing that we put up and will measure for is that Parliament should scrutinise government administration and policy. How has government through its agencies, its departments, actually fulfilled its functions during the pandemic? Has its actions actually been effective in slowing the spread of the pandemic? And these are things that where Parliament has yet to examine these that a Royal Commission or other process may well yet be announced. And indeed, the Albanese government has indicated a willingness to have an inquiry of that kind. As Woodrow Wilson from the US explained, it is the proper duty of a representative body to look diligently into every affair of government and to talk about how much and to talk much about what it sees. And this talking about and scrutinising administration and policy is never more vital than during a pandemic when these policies and procedures have such a dramatic impact upon people's lives. So that's the fourth thing we're looking for, is its capacity as a parliamentary body to scrutinise in those areas. Now, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to hand over to Harry, who's going to take you through and how do we measure this? What answers did we have about these? And then I'll come back and wrap up. Harry. Thanks, George. Uh, thanks, everyone, as well. Uh, so you, it's hard to, as George said, bring your mind back to the pandemic. I know I was very excited about giving this talk, but not about thinking about the pandemic. Uh, so I apologise. We'll, we'll go into some quite uh, fine detail here. Uh, the first point to say is that um, on the criterion that Parliament should meet regularly, uh, unfortunately, the pandemic affected the capacity of Australian parliaments to meet this core function. And you can see from this slide that in 2020, every Australian parliament, except for the Parliament of Western Australia, sat for fewer days than their recent average or historical average pre-COVID. Uh, and unsurprisingly, jurisdictions that had higher case numbers and greater transmissibility or greater risk of transmissibility lost more days. The New South Wales Parliament was lost the greatest number of days in 2020, but the experience there was far from unique. New South Wales, Commonwealth and Victorian Parliaments all lost more than 20 days across both Houses of Parliament, and that ended up being about 20% or a bit over 20% of what you'd expect that they would sit normally. The Northern Territory Legislative Assembly also sat for a significantly fewer number of days in 2020, while the Territory did not experience a spike of cases, the increased vulnerability of its population resulted in a more cautious approach. You can see that WA performed really well. The state eliminated COVID uh, or community transmission, transmission of COVID in mid-April and did not report more than a handful of cases until December 2021. Following some initial challenges, the Parliament actually increased the number of sitting days that they were expected to hold uh, that, that year in order to more appropriately deal with the pandemic and the rush of legislation and accountability measures that would need to be undertaken. The situation was a little better in 2021, though you can see that some jurisdictions, notably New South Wales, again performed relatively poorly. So this data is useful, but it is also limited, right? It doesn't tell us how Parliament responded in the immediate stages of the pandemic. What actions did they take at the height of the crisis, i.e. between late March 2020 and May 2020, when COVID first uh, really uh, struck Australia? Again, uh, the results are not great. The New South Wales Parliament and Victorian Parliaments, for example, met just once over a two month period in April and May. The Commonwealth Parliament met only five times. Uh, it's worth clearly stating that during this period, legislation of great significance was being passed. On the 23rd of March, 2020, the Commonwealth Parliament passed legislation authorising $66 billion in spending. At the very next sitting, on the 8th of April, $130 billion of spending was authorised. Uh, the failure to really sit regularly meant that these funding commitments did not receive appropriate debate, and parliamentarians at the time were concerned about this and raised issues with this in Hansard. So why did Parliament fail to meet regularly? Why did Parliaments all around the country fail to meet regularly? Uh, clearly, uncertainty was a defining characteristic of the early days of the pandemic. Uh, it's not surprising that in March 2020, Parliaments across Australia were quick to adjourn. However, our analysis shows, or suggests, I should say, that Government suspended Parliament to evade accountability. They did, so, they did so by using their numbers in Parliament to suspend the legislature for significant lengths of time. And uh, New South Wales provides a particularly alarming example. Following a rise in case numbers, the New South Wales Premier announced a two-week lockdown of Greater Sydney on the 26th of June 2021. People living in Sydney, the Central Coast, the Blue Mountains and Wollongong were permitted to leave their homes only for essential reasons. These included shopping for food, medical care, compassionate needs, exercise and essential work. Case numbers continued to rise, however. 
and the lockdown was extended several times and more significant restrictions were placed on all residents within the state. Residents in local government areas of concern, which happened to all be in Western Sydney, were placed under curfews and were required to wear a mask at all times outside the House. They also faced more overt police enforcement. It was not until 11 October 2021, 107 days later, that the lockdown rules were eased for fully vaccinated people. The following day, the New South Wales Parliament sat for its first meeting since 24 June. So this means that for the entire 107 day lockdown, the Parliament did not sit. So all of the regulations, all of the delegated instruments that were introduced during this time were not under any form of accountability by the Parliament, by elected representatives. But this was not for lack of trying by some parliamentarians. On the 14th of September 2021, members of the New South Wales Legislative Council attempted to reconvene Parliament. However, the government thwarted this by relying on Standing Order 34, which provides that the House will not meet until a minister is present. Conveniently, no government minister turned up. So the president said he had no choice but to end the sitting. So this aborted attempt at democracy is the closest that the state came to a functioning parliament during the 107 day lockdown. The absence of parliament enabled ministers to control their messaging to an unprecedented degree. Question time was replaced by a well-scripted daily press conference, leaving parliamentarians unable to test justifications for public health orders, to demand documents on modelling, or even to consider anything about the lockdowns. As one member of parliament noted at the time, Dan Murphy's is open, but Parliament isn't. We send nurses, doctors, ambos, police, teachers, transport workers, retail workers back to work, but politicians are too precious. No matter the time or crisis, democracy and oversight is not an optional extra. The failure of Australia's parliaments to sit regularly compares unfavourably with the experiences of parliaments during historical crises. Famously, the UK Parliament continued to sit through World War II, including the Battle of Britain. At one stage, the House of Commons was destroyed by a bomb, but the Parliament still sat in the Lords the next day. Even the Ukrainian Parliament has continued to operate, albeit under distinct procedures, despite the Russian invasion. And on 3 March 2022, it convened for a rapid-fire 17-minute session while Russian forces were barely 20 kilometres from Kiev. Of course, pandemics present different challenges to war. As large collective bodies comprised of relatively older people that tend to be in close contact uh, with more people than ordinary citizens, parliaments may be particularly vulnerable to pandemics. Nevertheless, while pandemics may be rare, they do occur, and parliaments have had to manage the difficulties they provoke while fulfilling their responsibilities to meet uh, and represent their constituents. Indeed, the Commonwealth and New South Wales parliaments sat more often during the year that the Spanish flu ravaged the country than they did during COVID. The failure to sit is particularly concerning given advances in technology since 1919, uh, which would allow parliamentarians to continue to meet in relative safety. The Commonwealth Parliament did recognise this almost immediately. Uh, on the 23rd of March 2020, that, that day sitting they had before they went to lockdown, the House adopted a resolution authorising the Parliament to meet via video conferencing. However, it was not until 20 August, over 150 days later, that it was finally agreed that members who were not able to be present because of COVID would be, able to be, uh, would be able to present through hybrid virtual technology. Nevertheless, there were significant restrictions placed on those who would uh, attend remotely. Those participating online were not permitted to vote. They were not permitted to be part of a quorum. They could not move motions or propose or support a proposal to discuss a matter of public importance or call a division. So the experience in Australia compares poorly with that elsewhere, where hybrid proceedings were not unusual. So here, even when Parliament sat, many of its members were not able to contribute. So their constituents, us, were left shortchanged. During a crisis, when urgent measures are required, we can agree that maybe the slow and deliberative legislative process is unsuitable. At the onset of the pandemic, Australian Parliaments accepted that standing orders would need to be suspended to facilitate the, the expedited debate and passage of key legislation. In the Federal Parliament, business for the 23rd March and 8 April sittings was restricted to urgent matters related to COVID-19. However, while opportunities for debate were more limited than usual, the government's bills were not simply introduced into Parliament to be ratified. Members and senators were given time to discuss each bill and propose amendments. And the main bill, the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Omnibus Bill, was even amended in the Senate. Debate was brief, but its existence was a recognition that genuine constructive engagement from members of all parties, drawing from the issues experienced by their constituents, could improve the government's measures. So this is the point about debate on key measures. This is supposed to improve measures, right? And this can be seen in the fact that the House sat for over nine hours. Um, 
The approach in Australia compares favourably to New Zealand and Canada. Uh, on the 25th of March 2020, the New Zealand Parliament was recalled for an emergency session. There are no quorum requirements for the New Zealand Parliament, and social distancing restrictions meant only 22 members of the 120-member body uh, attended. Two pieces of emergency legislation were passed with minimal debate. No amendments were proposed or made, and the entire sitting lasted just over three hours and 30 minutes. In Canada, the House was provided with even less time for debate, just 25 minutes before they suspended their parliament. So time may have been provided for debate on key measures and issues in the Commonwealth Parliament, but social distancing requirements and the need to reduce the risk of transmission meant that not all members could attend. Many were paired. Pairing is an unofficial arrangement between members organised by party whips, whereby a member from one side of the House promises to be absent when a member from the other House is, is due to be absent. It is a mechanism that maintains the relative voting strength of the parties when a parliamentarian is unable to attend a sitting due to illness, personal emergency, or because they are on official duties outside Canberra. Reflecting the fact that parliamentarians must represent their constituents, pairing is relatively rare, and it's generally kept to a minimum. In the final regular sitting week before the declaration of a public health emergency, no more than two parliamentarians were on leave and three were paired on any day. But the situation changed dramatically once COVID entered Australia. So you can see here that pairing dramatically scaled up. These pairing arrangements were important. They preserved the government's narrow majority while facilitating the meeting of parliament in uncertain times. However, as Stephen Mills has noted, these achievements came at a cost to the essential representative character of the parliament. At the 23rd March sitting, for example, roughly 6 million Australians lacked representation in the House. And you can see it was even more on the, second, the next sitting on the 8th of April. But on that 23rd March sitting, women were particularly underrepresented. Less than 20% of the members who attended were women. Only four of the 14 Western Australian representatives and no Tasmanian MPs attended. And neither did the two Indigenous members of the House. So the extensive use of pairs should be avoided. Alternative options to facilitate the presence of members in Parliament should be prioritised to ensure adequate representation of all Australians. Given this, it's difficult to understand why it took so long for Parliament to implement hybrid sittings. And in any case, as we noted, the problems caused by this delay were amplified by the restrictions placed on their attendance or their participation by remote members. Members participating via video link were unable to vote or move motions. Those who participated remotely were thus inhibited in their essential functions. And as you can see, that was a lot of people. The pandemic also exposed long-standing deficiencies in mechanisms of legislative oversight. While this problem is evident across a number of Australian jurisdictions, it's well illustrated by the Commonwealth Biosecurity Act, which provides a comprehensive framework for the management of biosecurity risks in Australia. On the 21st of January 2020, the Director of Human Biosecurity made a determination adding human coronavirus with pandemic potential as a listed human disease. This determination is a precondition for the declaration of a human biosecurity emergency. On the 18th of March 2020, with cases rapidly rising, the Governor-General declared that a human biosecurity emergency existed. The Act prevents Parliament from disallowing the Governor-General's declaration of a human biosecurity emergency. This means Parliament is unable to scrutinise such a declaration or overturn it. A human biosecurity emergency period extends for a maximum of three months. But Parliament also authorised the Governor-General to make successive declarations of emergency without limiting uh, how many times this can occur. Given the risks associated with COVID-19, the period of emergency was extended repeatedly over the following months. Once a human biosecurity emergency exists, the Health Minister is personally vested with the broadest possible authority. The Minister assumes godlike powers supplanting even those of the Prime Minister. The law permits the Health Minister to determine any requirement and make any direction they believe is necessary to prevent or control the entry emergence, establishment or spread of disease into any part of Australia or any other country. This includes imposing restrictions on persons, goods or conveyances to prevent movement, including entering or leaving specified places. The Act also empowers biosecurity officers to impose control orders on individuals who have been exposed to or show signs of symptoms of a listed human disease. Control orders may require a person to remain in a particular place, undergo decontamination or examination, and receive a vaccination or medication. The consequences of disobeying the Health Minister are severe. A person who refuses direction, perhaps that they remain in their home or undergo a medical procedure, can be jailed for up to five years or fined $66,000. No defences are provided for conscientious objection or on religious grounds. Delegated legislation is not unusual. In, in fact, it constitutes about half the law of the Commonwealth by volume. Parliament cannot debate and amend legislative instruments, but, they exercise, but it exercises oversight through the power of disallowance. 
legislative instruments must be tabled in each House of Parliament within six sitting days after they are registered and enter into force. Any member of the House of Representatives or the Senate may give notice to disallow an instrument within 15 sitting days after it was tabled. However, this procedure can be modified and in many cases some delegated instruments uh, cannot be disallowed. They are exempt from disallowance. This too is not unusual but it is controversial. Many of the public health orders issued to respond to the pandemic were exempt from disallowance. Under the Biosecurity Act, Parliament is prevented from disallowing any determination made by the Minister. Most remarkably, the Health Minister can make determinations that override other laws. And you can see there, are, I think George mentioned right at the start, there were some 547 made across all the states and territories in the first four months, uh, and uh, another 127 at the Commonwealth level. And here's just several of them <laughs> found here. So the government relied on these powers to issue voluminous orders. In many cases, they were announced late at night and they were changed by the morning. For the Commonwealth alone, between 18 March 2020 and 17 April, a period of 760 days, 727 legislative instruments were made. And as I said, at the state and territory level, there were 547 instruments made in the first 65 days of the pandemic. And many of these were exempt from disallowance. In December 2020, for instance, the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation noted that of the 249 instruments that had been made at that point, about 20% were exempt from disallowance by the Parliament and also exempt from scrutiny by the committee. Of course, Parliament can only disallow legislative instruments when it's sitting. So the failure to sit regularly limited the capacity of Parliament to exercise oversight even over instruments that were disallowable. While all public health orders imposed significant impositions on the lives of Australian residents, some had potentially life or death implications. In April 2021, the Health Minister banned Australians from returning home if they'd been in India over the prior 14 days. This stranded 9,000 citizens who faced the choice of navigating the pandemic in India with a rampant COVID-19 or returning to Australia and receiving a possible five-year jail sentence. Parliament may have forgone the capacity to disallow many legislative instruments that impose severe restrictions on residents, but parliamentary committees did, parliamentary committees did continue to meet and provide a degree of legislative oversight. Oops, sorry. However, as Eric Windholz has noted, such as the speed with which the ex executive acted, these committees could only conduct ex post review rather than provide real-time scrutiny. A different approach could have been taken. During World War II, the National Security Act granted the federal government sweeping powers to secure public safety and the defence of the nation. However, Parliament retained the power to disallow these regulations. This meant that the people's elected representatives scrutinised the conduct of the war. On occasion, Parliament did disallow regulations despite the government arguing they were needed to prosecute the war. Parliament's role was safeguarded during this crisis. During the COVID-19 pandemic, however, Parliament did not only cede its authority, but largely abrogated its responsibility to maintain legislative oversight and exercise effective scrutiny. Uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, governments were under extreme pressure to, to take action and protect their communities against a poorly understood virus with no vaccine and overwhelmed health sectors. Sometimes this led to unusual actions. For example, concerned that the Biosecurity Act conferred the Health Minister Greg Hunt with extraordinary powers, Prime Minister Scott Morrison appointed himself in secret as a second Health Minister. Although flawed and as former Justice Virginia Bell found unnecessary, the decision made some sense in it provided an opportunity for greater oversight of the Health Minister's powers. Of course, it would have been better if the Parliament had just amended the Biosecurity Act to provide that appropriate uh, supervision. Nevertheless, there were other areas where the Parliament could also perform better scrutiny of government administration. And in this final point, I'm just going to focus on one, uh, the introduction of the National Cabinet. Early in the pandemic, governments recognised the need for a coordinated and consistent response. On the 13th of March 2020, the Council of Australian Governments, COAG, agreed to form a National Cabinet to facilitate the cooperation and coordination across the Federation. The National Cabinet comprised the Prime Minister, State Premiers and Territory Chief Ministers, and held its first meeting two days later on the 15th of March. A few weeks later, the Prime Minister announced that a new National Federation Reform Council, which consisted of National Cabinet, uh, the Council on Federal Financial Relations, and a representative from the Australian Local Government Association, would replace COAG. National Cabinet was quick and agile. It met regularly, often multiple times a week, and did so online, so avoiding the need and the time for travel. Recognising that the pandemic may affect different areas of the country in different ways, the National Cabinet sought to agree on a broad framework uh, and allow the states and territories to implement the solutions that would make most sense for them. In bringing together leaders from both sides of politics and providing a forum for Australian governments to make decisive uh, collective decisions relating to the pandemic response, the National Cabinet received wide praise. But concerns were raised almost immediately about the terminology and purported status of the National Cabinet as a committee 
of the Commonwealth Government's Cabinet. The National Cabinet was formally established as a policy committee of the Commonwealth Government's Cabinet. The Government adopted this approach to attract conventions of collective responsibility and confidentiality. These conventions flow from the system of responsible government, which underpins Australia's constitutional system and promotes robust discussion within Cabinet. They require members publicly support all Cabinet decisions, even if they not, did not support the decision or were not present for the meeting. They also exempt Cabinet documents from FOI requests, freedom of information requests, and prohibit members from disclosing the nature or content of any deliberations. However, as many people have noted, this arrangement was fundamentally flawed. The National Cabinet was not a Cabinet in the traditional sense because members were not responsible to the same Parliament. State Premiers were responsible to their own Parliament and their own jurisdiction, and they made decisions on that basis. Nonetheless, the Government continued to assert that Cabinet confidentiality would apply to prevent deliberations and documents from being released. This meant that important documents that were previously published, uh, by, such as those by the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee, which related to COVID-19 and its impact, suddenly became confidential. As a dissenting report by the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee found, the decision diminished public knowledge and buttressed the ability of dangerous fools to spread misinformation about Australia's public health response during the pandemic. The government went to great lengths to impose secrecy on the National Cabinet's decisions. In July 2020, Independent Senator Rex Patrick made an FOI request seeking access to meeting notes and minutes from the May 2020 meeting. When these were denied, he lodged a claim with the AAT. Uh, in August the following year, so a whole year later, August 2021, the AAT ruled that the National Cabinet was not a committee of the Commonwealth Government's Cabinet. Justice White explained that the mere use of the name National Cabinet does not of itself have the effect of making a group of persons using the name a committee of the Cabinet. Nor does the mere labelling of a committee as a Cabinet committee have that effect. Indeed, such a submission suggests that any committee may be a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act, merely because the Prime Minister of the day has purported to establish it as such. And as he explained, this premise is unsound. National Cabinet minutes were not an official record of Cabinet and they were not exempt from disclosure. The Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet released the requested documents, but the Federal Government refused to accept the outcome. The Department declined to provide access to other requests for documents. And AAT decisions are not binding, so they were perfectly within their right to do so. In September 2021, so the month after this decision was handed down, the Government introduced legislation into Parliament to overturn the ruling. The COAG Legislation Amendment Bill would amend the FOI Act to expressly include the National Cabinet and any of its subcommittees, providing a blanket exemption from FOI law. A Government committee recommended the bill be passed over the objections of Labor, the Greens and Senator Patrick. The bill lapsed at the dissolution of the 46th Parliament, so the last Parliament. However, the new Labor Government has continued to prevent the release of National Cabinet documents, despite its position in opposition. Uh, the new Federal Government's decision illustrates the need to, for the Parliament to reassert its constitutional role to scrutinise and monitor the executive, we would argue. I'm going to hand back over to George now to sum up. Thanks, Harry. Uh, so when we looked across the functions of Parliament and asked some questions about how well it performed in light of what we should expect as citizens our Parliament to do, we found that Parliament, even though it had some notable achievements, often performed poorly. It didn't live up to expectations for what a legislative body should do during this period, though of course the answer differed, sometimes based upon the different parliaments. New South Wales in particular had a particularly problematic record, given its failure to sit even in the face of members attempting to convene the Upper House for a sitting. What our research also shows is that this record was often very convenient. Uh, as citizens were faced with daily press conferences, that was the way they received their information, carefully managed by the executive, carefully managed by our leaders, and the absence of parliamentary scrutiny was effective for preventing questioning about that, the ability to access documents, the ability to look at modelling. It enabled the message to be tightly controlled. The result, though, was across the pandemic, particularly at some key points, particularly when we saw Victoria and New South Wales in quite a brutal lockdown, was that Parliament had effectively abdicated key functions at critical times. It did so because at least some parliaments were simply missing in action completely during those lockdowns. They did not sit at key points. Another factor, though, was that Parliament itself had already given up its key powers to make laws in these areas to the executive without enabling it the possibility of scrutiny through disallowance. 
And as Harry has indicated, the most egregious example of that is the Commonwealth Biosecurity Act, a piece of legislation that authorises the executive not only to make any measure it thinks necessary to deal with the public health emergency, but to do so without the prospect of parliamentary disallowance, and to do so in a way that can override any other law. There's no greater power on the Commonwealth Statute Book than the Biosecurity Act, and there's nothing on the Statute Book gets, that gets as close to making any person a dictator as that particular law. It's truly extraordinary that we would give, through our parliament, a health minister, or in this case two health ministers, the power to make these rules without disallowance and to override any other law. What more broadly the study shows is that many of these things we've talked about aren't surprising or even particularly new. Uh, we're not suggesting that the pandemic suddenly threw up a host of new problems that should be surprising about Parliament and its known weaknesses. What the study shows is in fact that the pandemic exacerbated known problems within Parliament. It brought to the surface issues which became far more extreme, far more pronounced during a pandemic because issues such as executive domination were taken to much greater heights. And again, we've seen this before during World War II in particular, but also World War I. But this pandemic was different in terms of the level of executive domination, and also particularly given the need in a pandemic to have scrutiny, transparency, to maintain public confidence, much of the measures or the absence of parliament went counter to the public need for those things to be achieved. And indeed, if we look at the areas where things became particularly extreme, um, again, in exacerbating known problems, they do relate to the fact particularly of delegated legislation, uh, which has become such a dominant form of lawmaking, around half of the statute book, but also especially exacerbating that issue around the absence of disallowance. And certainly in our view, um, an absence of disallowance should only be permitted in the most extreme cases. It should be, as a fundamental rule, that when the executive makes laws with the benefit of parliamentary authorisation, almost always parliament should retain the ability to disallow those rules. And that strikes us as a very basic, important facet of democracy. And indeed, the Senate committee that Harry mentioned to essentially said that in recognising the need and role of parliament to exercise ongoing scrutiny. But in fact, that's not what the legislation says. It's not what the Biosecurity Act says. And it remains the case that should there be a future pandemic, that it's possible our leaders can again make laws without appropriate scrutiny. The other area where we saw extreme behaviour, amongst others, was not just about executive domination of the parliament, but executive domination over another part of the executive. And of course, the, the fact that our prime minister assumed multiple ministries in secret goes and extends to an extreme level, a trend we've seen over a long period of time, where a Prime Minister seeks to exert tight control, not only over Cabinet, but indeed over the broader party room. But in this case, it went to lengths we've not seen before in this country. But again, it can be seen as an extension of actions we've seen in the past. What we take away from the study is that we need to be realistic about actually what we would expect of Parliament. And what we set up was perhaps an idealised form of what we would like Parliament to have done uh, during this particular pandemic. But we need to realise that Parliament was never likely to live up to that idealised sense of what it should deliver. Its deficiencies when it comes to executive domination, when it comes to the fact that it had already given up the ghost through the Biosecurity Act, it had already given the ability for people to make extensive rules and regulations without disallowance, was a pre-pandemic problem that simply came to the surface during this special period. What it does say, though, is that now is the time to think more deeply about these things. There will be another pandemic, there will be future crises, and we do need to learn the lessons of what occurred during this period. We need to be realistic about just how much we can undo executive domination of parliament. But now is the time to ask hard questions about things such as the Biosecurity Act and the preponderance towards executive lawmaking without appropriate scrutiny. We also need to be putting into place uh, rules that mean that should video and other forms of parliamentary meeting being required, they can be quickly put into action. They're ready to go as opposed to being developed on the run. It is foreseeable that we will need these things again. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we do know we should make those preparations.
And what these recent events showed was that Parliament was not ready. It had not put in place those things and has now been forewarned about the need to do so again. In order to assure that Parliament can meet, it can scrutinise, it can fulfil its function. And even though we don't suggest that all of this can be got right, that Parliament can achieve the idealised form we've talked about, there's no doubt it can do much better. And in fact, if you look at other parliaments in the UK and around the world, it's clear that other parliaments did so, and we have some ground to make up. So we're hopeful, perhaps optimistic, perhaps naive, um, about the possibilities of actually looking at this work and thinking about the prospect of improving parliament, because it's our view that even though Australia navigated the pandemic well compared to many other countries, there is ground that needs to be made up. And particularly when it comes to parliament, we need to revisit fundamentals and make sure parliament is present, effective, and playing its proper role the next time Australia deals with a crisis or a public health emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Hobbs and Professor Williams, for that uh, fascinating survey of the pandemic through the lens of how parliaments performed. Um, we do have some time for questions. Um, if anyone does have a question they would like to ask of Dr Hobbs or Professor Williams, if you could raise your hand. We've got a roving microphone that we'll bring to you. And please, if you can wait till you receive the microphone before you speak, just so we can pick up your voice on the broadcast. I think we've got someone down the front. Sorry, I didn't see you there, sir. I think we've got um, someone down the front first and then we'll come to you. Um, you mentioned the um, actions of the Prime Minister swearing himself in as uh, Health Minister and six subsequent uh, ministries. Um, I, well, a, a comment first. Uh, I consider that some of the actions of the Morrison government were part of the culture of a lack of accountability, lack of transparency and the culture of cover-up for, um, for what it's worth. But... Um, I would have thought that the Governor-General had a role in um, perhaps acting as a break on the excesses of the executive in that situation. Can you comment on that, um, that role and whether that's a uh, convention or a um, uh, specific role of the Governor-General? It's a good question and yes, you might have thought so but the system doesn't work that way and hasn't worked that way. And, and essentially that's because the Governor-General uh, is a bit of a cipher in these circumstances. Um, there hasn't been uh, clear procedures for the Governor-General publicising this information. It's been expected that the executive itself would do so. And they're real problems. And in fact, that's what the report identifies. And even if we take a step back from that quite extreme measure of the multiple ministries, there are many other examples in prior governments where in fact, Ministerial appointments have been made, not properly notified. It's been difficult to work out at any one time who can exercise powers, particularly where they extend across multiple ministers. So I'd say there's been quite an endemic cultural problem of not having proper transparency about who's exercising powers at any particular time. And I think the Governor-General uh, might have done more, but realistically this is a problem within the executive itself. And if nothing else, the Governor-General follows the instructions of the executive. So I, I think it's something that does need to be fixed and I'm glad to see legislation and other measures are being proposed because it's a wake-up call, um, that particular episode. Yeah, I agree. I think it's the Governor General's in a difficult position sometimes to, to, to tell the Prime Minister no in these cases. I think ever since um, well, the Whitlam dismissal particularly, the Governor General, is, his role essentially is just to do what the executive says and they're not going to really stand up in any overt way. There are obviously some sort of more surreptitious ways. The Governor just said, I assume these would be announced publicly in the due process, in the due course of things. They weren't, they could have done something then, but we just don't really know what happened. So I would agree with George there. There, there have been examples where Governors General have... There have been examples where Governors General have um, asked Prime Ministers to reconsider certain actions. Um, so it's, it's not unprecedented. It's, it's not a fait accompli that the Governor General accepts the, the advice from the Prime Minister. So. No, and absolutely, and, and you'd expect a Governor-General would advise and warn. That's right. And, and we can never quite know what happened, of course. We weren't there for the conversations. But either 
there was advice and warning, but the Prime Minister just didn't take it and proceeded, which the Prime Minister was entitled to do so. Um, or perhaps it was just never thought that this wouldn't be publicised and there's an error, procedural error almost at that point. I suspect it's the latter, I don't know, but what happened was so extreme and striking that you just never would have anticipated that a person would take on all these ministries and not even tell their colleagues, let alone the public about it, that sometimes we're blindsided by things that we just think, surely that wouldn't happen. But again, it did, and that's where I think there's a lesson to be learned. Thank you, and we've got a question up here. Um, I'm not an expert in any of this, but um, listening to what you're saying, does Parliament itself have a, um, a go up and clean, go back and clean up the mess type of approach? And that is, when you go and look at what you're saying, because of the speed and everything like that, obviously some things were done that weren't optim optimal. So my question is, is there a process? where they can go back over the last few years and look at it and say, we don't want any of this mess lying around. Are there fixes for it? And it's, it's one reason that you know, I certainly strongly support, whether it be a Royal Commission or other process, to go back and look at what happened. And we've had a few Royal Commissions in recent years, but I would have thought that um, the expenditure across billions of dollars, the impact upon liberties, uh, economic livelihoods would demand a thorough investigation if only to learn what went wrong, what went right, to inform the next pandemic response and also to clean up the mess as to what's left over. But we haven't yet had that public accounting and reckoning. Again, the government has suggested it will do that and it should happen. And we've got to the time where we shouldn't be waiting really much longer. You know, memories start to fade, documents perhaps get harder to identify, and I think that's the, that's the critical thing. And Parliament has a key role in this as well, um, not just to implement the findings, but to look at the legislation that was on the books and to ask, can it be improved? Victoria has done this. They have passed new public health legislation informed by the Charter of Human Rights down there, which is markedly different in terms of scrutiny and other measures, and they've said it can't happen again in that way. So they've done that. On the other hand, the Commonwealth just hasn't come to grips with the biosecurity legislation in any meaningful way. Um, and that is the central point of concern. And that comes down to political will, I think, too. As I said, part of this is convenience. I mean, executives like to have these powers, and particularly at difficult times, it's uncomfortable to be scrutinised. Um, but that's actually what we need. Um, the more extreme the powers, the greater the vigilance and scrutiny. And that's not what we saw. Um, during the pandemic. Yeah, and I, I'd agree with that. I'd also say, as George mentioned, many of the issues that popped up during the pandemic are long-standing. Um, so things like the use of delegated legislation that is non-disallowable and that can't be overturned by Parliament or challenged by Parliament is a real problem. Uh, and you know, I think they said 20% of the delegated scrutiny committee said 20% of the instruments passed during the pandemic were not disallowable, could not be challenged, could not be scrutinised. Um, and I think that's a clear issue that can just be fixed anyway, right? You don't need to go through a massive Royal Commission for that. You can end up a process where you don't work through delegated legislation the same way and don't have, or don't have non-disallowable instruments. And they were particularly extreme. So, I mean, as Harry indicated in, in his part of the talk, that the fact that they could prevent Australian citizens returning from India and leave them in circumstances where it's foreseeable some would die, Parliament wasn't able to disallow that. Um, if, if the executive decided to mandate vaccines despite the community concern, that would not have been disallowable. Yet that's exactly what Parliament should be debating. I mean, this is the bread and butter of an elected representative body is these big contentious issues, not only because it's right to ask, did the executive get it right, but the people need to see it being argued out. And the absence of that, again, I saw repeatedly fed into levels of distrust in particular of the government response because people are right to ask, have they got it right? Are they hiding something? How can we feel confident that, in fact, they've made the right decisions? And often we couldn't. I think that's a really good point. I think a lot of the uh, rise in people who are sort of um, that pseudo-law sovereign citizen type of argument where people saying, I don't need to wear a mask to go into the shops and these sort of things, I think comes from the fact that, you know, for the first time, maybe, they felt that they, they were feeling the full force of the law and they, their views, however we might agree or disagree with them, just weren't being ventilated, weren't being considered, weren't being debated and weren't being um, challenged, I suppose, in, in the parliament, the, the, the forum where these issues are debated. Um, yep, we've got another couple of questions over here. I think we've got time for maybe two more quick questions. So it's me. 
Uh, look, I have a couple of points. Uh, the, the first is an observation, and it's, it's suggested by that statement up there. At times, you seem to be saying it really was up to Parliament, and they should have pulled their finger out. They should be re reasserting themselves. They abdicated their role. And to some extent, I thought that might be a little unfair. Um, I expected a little more empirical detail, uh, and perhaps it's in your paper, so perhaps, uh, perhaps you could advise us about that. But my main point is about the fact that if you look at the Morrison governments, the two of them, uh, and track through some of the things you were talking about, you will find that uh, there were already issues, special issues about executive domination. So if you look at the in the debate, I think the Morrison government has the record for it, and I think that started before COVID. As you say, these things were exacerbated by COVID. You certainly appropriately emphasised uh, delegate legislation was exploited and disallowance was exploited. You didn't have uh, much to say about oversight or scrutiny of administration, uh, but the evidence is there uh, that they were not responding to commission reports, for example, to a much greater in the past. And I could go on, there were other dimensions there. So if your starting point was what happened under the Morrison government rather than what happened under COVID, you'd actually expose these issues of um, a government notorious in other respects. Yeah, thank you. And, and you're right. And, and yes, the paper's a lot of the empirical detail, obviously, we can't cover in the talk. And and what's interesting is, yes, you can point to the Morrison government, but what the research shows is that these issues are just as prevalent in state and territory governments too. That, um, in fact, in some cases, the level of control was much higher at the state and the absence of scrutiny was higher. New South Wales being a standout example where they simply failed to meet. And again, that really pertinent example, the MPs turned up, tried to convene the upper house, and the government refused to send a minister, and that, as a result, prevented them from even meeting. And they wanted to turn up as they wanted to demand documents about modelling and other things relating to the lockdown. And that's just one. And, and it went often to the administration points you're saying. And it shows, again, when it comes to parliaments, these are general problems across parliaments um, in Australia. Um, and they tend to be deep cultural points about how our Westminster system is operating. Um, and I also don't want to suggest that you know, there aren't some high points. And there are. There are, there are really positive examples of parliamentarians trying to assert the parliamentary role, New South Wales Upper House being one prominent example, the Senate Scrutiny Committee being another one. I mean, that report is a landmark report and about delegated legislation. It's where you would start if you wanted to fix these things. It's you know, a really strong document, that one. So we identify those things and say there are good things we can pick up on. The question is, is there the will? Um, and how can we take it forward? Yeah, I agree with that. And I'd say also I take your point that um, you know, we say Parliament should reassert its role. You know, often governments dominate Parliament, the executive dominates Parliament, and Parliament is in a weaker position already. Um, but as George said, there are lots of, lots of areas for parliamentarians to, to do more uh, and to take, make more of an impact in these areas. And certainly governments do not always uh, control the upper house, but upper houses also adjourned for lengthy periods of time uh, and weren't able to come back in many cases as well, whether that was a standing order that said a government member needed to be there or not. Uh, and so I think in most cases, Parliament really did just abdicate and, and say, we'll come back in 100 days, 200 days, whenever it is, uh, and they shouldn't have done that. OK, I think we've got time for one final question. Um, you've, you've spoken about the prevalence of delegated legislation throughout COVID, which was exempt from parliamentary disallowance. So throughout the time of the pandemic, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights was the only legislative scrutiny committee uh, with the capacity to scrutinise that legislation uh, comprehensively. I'm interested in what your observations are uh, in terms of the weight that was given to the committee's uh, recommendations to the parliament and what lessons might be drawn out of uh, that process. Yeah, I think the Parliamentary Joint Committee of Human Rights did a good job as well in um, just documenting how many instruments were made and, and sort of there's, I think the tally is still online so you can still find it if you want to look at it, what, what, you know, what was made, what did they say and you know, when were they passed, this sort of thing, when were they implemented. So I think that, that Parliamentary Committee did a really good job and I think the, so the Human Rights Committee and the Delegated Security Committee were both um, two standouts in this area. Uh, I think, again, though, it comes down to the fact that whether when all these things, committees can't 
change things, right? It's got to be the, the panel, the government really needs to have the will to do this sort of stuff. So it's a great documentary record, uh, a lot of you know, great evidence for, for George and I to go through and, and, and sort of try to come up with some ideas and conclusions and recommendations for these things. But um, I don't think they were really able to do much during the time. It was all ex post, you know, the, the decision had been, determination had been made, it was a legislative instrument for many months at that point. There's nothing really that the committee can do except to publicise it and, and inform people that this is existing and that there are the challenges in the process and, and, uh, and really the rights um, uh, that have been affected by the instrument, but nothing at the time. And so we needed something stronger, which the committee is just not able to do. And I, th I think often what was missing is these committees are often doing good and valuable work, but the fact that Parliament was often not sitting or not sitting effectively told. Um, because, of course, as we know, these committees are meant to then resonate through parliamentary debate, they're picked up by the media, and there's good reasons why people are focused on other things, but they just perhaps didn't have the impact that they might have. Um, and I think, you know, Parliament sitting is often a vital aspect of committees actually achieving their goals. Um, and again, at this point, I would say if we're not going to just get that in Parliament, which we're not likely to, that's where we need the ex post facto process as well, to go through the committee work, to pick up what happens, learn the lessons, as has happened in Victoria, um, so that we have some legislative and procedural change for what is foreseeable, the next crisis, the next issue for which we would hope Parliament can perform better. Thank you. Uh, can everyone please join me again in thanking Professor Williams and Dr Hobbs. Um, I'll just let you know a recording of the lecture and information about our future lectures will be available on the Senate Lecture Series website, on the a on Senate Lecture Series page on the APH website, that's www.aph.gov.au. And we hope that you can join us for our next lecture, which will be on, the fri on Friday the 15th of September, presented by Ms Lena Rikula Tabang, Director of, for Asia and the Pacific for the International Institute of Democracy and Electoral Assistance. Um, and finally, if you're not already subscribed, can I encourage you to sign up to our email subscriber list? There's a list at the door. Um, or you can email us at research.sen at aph.gov.au. And thank you. That concludes our formal proceedings. Thank you.